pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the weekend. What would you rather be doing than listening to your favorite Friday money discussion? About 72 other things. But anyway, you're here, so you might as well listen. Today, we're talking about seven questions you should ask yourself to answer the question, why don't you ever seem to have enough money? To help us, we welcome from the Paychecks and Balances podcast, Marcus Garrett, and this here podcast, OG. And finally, from LenPenzo.com, it's Len Penzo. You thought I was going to say someone else crazy there as a joke, didn't you? But nope, this guy's keeping you on your toes. Plus, on today's Friday FinTech segment, looking for an easy way to save for college, so was this mom of three, which is partly why we're introducing you to Unest and founder Ksenia Yudina. We'll also magnify a caller's money situation and share a rousing round of my trivia. And now, because he's using this show to avoid shoveling snow, here he is, Joe Salcihai. There is so much, so much snow. It was snowing sideways here. Why did we move to Michigan? Hey there, everybody. I am Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and welcome to the weekend. And here to help me across this card table. It's uh, my good friend, OG. I didn't see you raising your hand helping shovel snow today. No, I retired from that yeah, probably that's... about five years ago, yeah, actually. Very, very nice of you. Thank you. But you know what? I needed a workout, and I couldn't get to the gym because there is so much snow. It was amazing. It's very pretty, though. Mm-hmm. It's okay. You, <laughs> so you say. You, you know, uh, speaking of pretty, here uh, <laughs> under... It's just a horrible transition. Here I love from, that one, though. That's the best from, one ever. Under, uh, somewhere deep under Los Angeles, California, it's our good friend, Len Penzo. You feeling pretty today, Len? Oh, I'm, <laughs> you know, it's it's the things you wear under the, the main clothes that make you feel pretty, and I feel absolutely beautiful today, Joe. That is... <laughs> sort of Spider-Man under Roos. He's feeling <laughs> just full of power. You just took awkward to 11. Like... <laughs> Maybe even to Maybe 12, like Len. skipped 11. No, I Len feel, did. I feel so beautiful and fresh. That is just, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Speaking of fresh, somebody lending a fresh perspective to this show. That might be a better transition. From, I think he's in Austin, Texas. We've had uh, his uh, partner in crime on a couple times. We still, well, you've been on the show before, Marcus. Marcus Garrett from Paychecks and Balances. You've been on before. I have. I have uh, covered the debt-free challenge or something to that effect. I was drowning in debt at the time. I remember the little uh, Photoshopped image of a hand reaching out for the water. I think I've seen that stock image all over the Internet, so that was uh, very hey. original. Not as original as the fresh shout-out, but, you know, up there, about number two. <laughs> so uh, you're in Austin, Texas. I am. I am. We had a brisk, cool 74-degree uh, winter day today. So Yeah, do you no reckon for us? Do you <laughs> Do you recognize the salute I'm giving you over the shortwave right now? It looks it looks familiar. It looks familiar. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I'm thinking about coming to visit you and uh, get some warmth. You familiar with the way luggage, Marcus? Put it up? No. I was going to freak like I have, although I think I've heard it before. Uh, but it's probably out of my price range. That's probably Oh, why. no, it's not. It's incredibly <laughs> economical for what you get. It's an amazing piece of luggage. This episode of Stacky Benjamins, believe it or not, Marcus, is brought to you by a way. <laughs> Away makes a shocker there, huh? Away makes first class luggage at coach prices. See, it says it right here. Yeah. That, that allows it. Marcus Garrett to charge your phone, his phone on the go for $20 off a suitcase. You get 20 bucks off just because you're on the show. Well, you could just be listening to the show. Go to awaytravel.com forward slash SB and use promo code SB. That's awaytravel.com slash SB, promo code SB. And we're also this week again brought to you by Murder Book, a new true crime podcast hosted by best selling author Michael Connolly, available on Apple Podcasts wherever you listen. Also, be sure to check out Dark Sacred Night, Michael Connolly's latest number one bestseller featuring detectives Harry Bosch and Renee Ballard. I've read the books. 
I love the series Bosch. Have you guys seen that? Marcus, have you seen the series Bosch? Uh, I have not. You got to watch about? that on Netflix. Harry Bosch is this really cool detective, and it just it's it's like this this true crime stuff. Lan, I, I would think you and the Honeybee are into like crime stuff. You'd like Bosch. You should watch that. I, I don't, but the Honeybee is a huge Michael Connolly fan and a huge Bosch fan. I remember when Bosch first came out on Netflix, she complained because that's not Bosch how she pictured it when she was reading right. about Bosch was totally different. Yeah, and it really irritated her. She's like, "That's not how I pictured." You know, Harry, it's Harry Bosch, right? Yes. But uh, anyways, I think she's totally used to it now, but she's totally into all that stuff. That, she's got every Michael Connolly book ever written. That was totally me, too. I thought, this isn't Bosch. And then by episode two, I'm like, okay, I'm in. It's fantastic. It was the same thing with the Jack Ryan with uh, with the dude from you know, the office. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, what was uh, John so Krasinski? That? Huh? John Krasinski. No. Ben What's that guy's name? He died. The other author. He did the Jack Ryan Tom Clancy. stuff. Tom Clancy, yeah. I never pictured Jack Ryan like uh, how they had the all the different people that played him. Alec, he, he looked a lot like Han Solo to me, personally. <laughs> that's that's how I pictured <laughs> Jack Ryan. Her, Harrison Ford, yeah. <laughs> nope. Han Solo. Swing and a miss. Well, we got a great show today. We got Marcus Garrett here from Paychecks and Balances to save the show. Thank God you're here, Marcus. <laughs> tell the, I appreciate it. The, the three people that don't know about your awesome podcast, tell us about it. So Paychecks and Balances, as you talked about, I have my co-host Rich, who's also been on here a few times. We help millennials raise their paychecks and lower their balances. And I think our most recent tagline, which I always butcher because for some reason we keep changing it, is we help millennials raise their paychecks, lower their balances, and get out of debt. Nice. I feel like I I feel like I'm missing something there. Hence the long drawn out thing. But Rich will come on and correct me when you (laughs) inevitably invite him back on the show. (laughs) Someday, you know. Leave it in, as we say. Hashtag he's got, leave it he's in. got the perfect name, too, for a personal finance pot. Rich. You know, it's the people named Penny that I usually have to worry about. Yeah. But, uh, somebody named Rich, boy, I'm, I'm right there. Right. I'm hanging on every word. <laughs> he's, he's got it. Well, we got Rich's partner. We, we couldn't get Rich today. We got Rich's partner today. Actually, really better half of the show, frankly. We, we, we <laughs> yeah, could... he, called, he called me in for the auto boy like 15 minutes before. Like <laughs> He made it seem like it was a question, but it was more of a mandate. He's like, you're going on a stack of Benjamins. I said, I'd be honored. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you for saving the show. We got a great show today. Let's talk about Let's talk about why people feel like they got no money. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our headline today comes to us from the Ladders, a personal finance area of the Ladders site. Uh, This is written by Pedram Soji. Never enough money? These seven questions help you make smarter spending decisions. I thought we'd walk through these seven questions about that you should ask yourself about uh, having money. And uh, let's start with you, Marcus, because when you were here last, you were talking right. about getting out of debt. Number one question is, are you living in survival mode? And I kind of remember you telling these stories about living paycheck to paycheck and truly being in survival mode. Yeah, I was working uh, three jobs at one point. So now I can uh, lecture to the millennials. I'm a senior millennial and I can be like, you know, back in my day, uphill both ways, three jobs. And so for those who are wondering, I I tell people, if you got the Dell computer without the warranty and it broke down, that was probably my fault because I had this uh, Dell job that I hated and I put computers together in a warehouse and I would bang them around as my passive aggressive way of taking it out on the man. Uh, But it was a well-paying job, like $16 an hour. (laughs) And then I worked hotels on the weekends. So I did night shifts at the hotel. And then I had, of course, the nine to five. You know, I got to bring in the paycheck. What I kind of look at now is, you know, do you have a spending surplus or a shortage? So everyone assumes they have an income shortage. But really, during that whole experience, I was just spending way too much money. And all I knew how to do was trade time for money. And so that's why I worked all those jobs. If that really might not be what you need to have to do. That's a good point, Len. A lot of people out there thinking, my life is going to be better when I make more money. And to Marcus's point, that's totally, totally not true. I'd say at least half the people, and I'll bet you more than half, they spend to their income level. So the income goes up, the spending goes up. And it's just that you're on that hamster wheel and you can't get off. The only way you're going to get off is to, when you get a raise, Put that extra money aside and try and keep your spending down so you have a nice gap 
of discretionary spending or discretionary money uh, as you get older. So that's the key. They talk about, Len, these inflection points in your life, like these important times. It seems like those raise times that you're talking about, like that's a seriously important time in your financial life. What you decide to do with that or, you know, just don't do. Yeah, I'd say the first, well, every raise I got, especially early in my career, I never saw it. I always put it towards, I used it to increase my 401k contributions or to in for a savings fund for something else that I was saving for big ticket long-term. But I always made sure those first few raises, I was, uh, I I never saw them. I I had automatic withdrawals and and it, when you do that, it's really painless actually. Why did you, why did you do that by the way? Cause you know, a lot of people don't do that. I bet Marcus says you made more money. You probably spent more money, right? Yeah, I tell people never underestimate their ability to spend more money. And I (laughs) I can definitely prove that. I can actually probably still prove that to this day. Uh, But to Lynn's point, um, one of the things that really people like on our episode, we did one where they talk about salary negotiation and the failure to negotiate salary in addition to when those raises come up. They did a study that just $5,000, so the difference between coming out of college, $50,000 and $55,000, that's more than a half a million over the course of your career. Your entire career is based on that failure to negotiate. So that 15-minute discussion, that uncomfortable thing that nobody likes to do, impacts you for the next 15 to 50 years. So yeah, get over it. <laughs> no, people. Yeah. I mean, the studies show that what 60 the recent study, I think, OG, that you and I did 60 percent of bosses will give you a raise if you just ask. Yeah. Nobody asks ask about it. Well, and this also supports the idea of making sure that your paycheck is going into an account that's separate from your spending account. If you are, you know, using a debit card or something like that, or you pay your bills out of your checking account, don't put your paycheck into your checking account because then you'll look and say, oh, I've got an extra 500 bucks. I should go spend it. If you put it in a different place and then routinely pay yourself from your paycheck, then you're consciously making the decision of when it's time to have some lifestyle increases, whether it's just regular inflationary increases or you decide to, you know, do something better. But how did uh, rent or something lend back to you in a, in a question I was formulating when I went to Marcus, which is those early raises you got, you decided to save them all. And, you know, most people don't do that right out of college. They don't do that at all. Did you do that out of fear? Did you do it because you're the way you were brought up? I mean, what was it that made you do something different than most millennials just starting their job do? Yeah, it, fear is a good Fear's a good word, especially, you know, engineering and your son might, hopefully he doesn't find out, but it's very cyclical and a lot of engineers will, they will get, they'll lose their jobs, you know, after just the economy takes a turn and and they start laying people off. And I've always lived under the fear of being laid off. So I was, you know, saving was, it was just in my blood. It was just a survival thing. It's like, gosh, if I, you know, if I get laid off, I've got to have so much cushion for, you know, maybe a year to be able to get another job. So yeah, fear is a good, good word, Joe. We had, we had Gabby Dunn on recently and she talked about money scripts and, uh, is that a money script in your family? Like were your family's people that always kind of planned ahead and, you know, winter is coming to quote Game of Thrones. No, my, if you're talking to me, Joe, my yeah. dad, uh, no, he, my dad's the exact opposite of me. He's always proudly said, I've never seen a Brinks truck follow a hearse. And the man spends as he gets it. And, and, uh, I mean, to this day, I mean, he's, he's God bless him. He's, he's 80 years old now, but he's, you know, he's pulled every trick in the book just to keep himself going. You know, th- th- he got to the point where he needed, oh, should I be sharing this on the, yeah, what the hey? So he, you know, he had to get a, a nobody he listens. A, no, I know he had to get, a, a, for example, a reverse mortgage. I mean, he was in a position where he didn't, you know, he outlived his nest egg pretty much. And so he got into the position where he needed to go with the reverse mortgage. And, and just as you know, now they're at the age now where he actually has to sell his house and um, he's going to be moving by my sister closer to, to, and I'm just praying that, you know, that reverse mortgage, he's going to be able not to, you know, yeah. be damaged by that once when, when he gets this, that household. Well, it's funny. And not even to that degree, because that's an extreme degree in this piece that says living in survival mode, this is where we live our lives. And it's the underlying reason we're always stressed. Marcus, I got to believe that you're working those three jobs. You don't have any money. You're in survival mode. You're probably way more stressed out then than you are now. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, one story that we shared recently on the new year is like I was about seven days into the new year. I remember that specifically because I was doing another interview and they asked me how my year was going. And on the seventh day, my car got towed. You know, God made the earth. And on the seventh day, he towed my car. Back in the day, this would have been a spiral into a dead and like this uncontrollable scenario because it was it was $300. Like I didn't have $300 laying around. This was not, not something I was playing. The Cowboys just win. So I was out celebrating, enjoying life. And like every apartment scam, there's not enough parking spaces. So if you get home after 8.01 p.m., you have to park in permit parking. I parked there a thousand times. But I got caught up in the New Year sweep and I came out to an empty parking space oh. and, snitch, you know, my manager had snitched on me. I, I thought snitches get stitches, but apparently we're under new rules in 2019. Um, and I had to, like, track down my vehicle. They couldn't find it at first when they finally did, because I told them 911 is going to be the next call that I place. They were like, yeah, and that'll be three hundred dollars. And then, of course, wait, there's more. It gets better. Shout out to Scary Movie is I get there and my headlight doesn't work. I don't know why. I think they're, you know, in co cohorts and everything like that. So I take it to the dealership up the street and allegedly I put my air quotes up. The fuse is out. So another three hundred dollars. And then they they told me they wanted to give me the benefit of rotating my tires and putting new tires on there, which would have been another eight hundred dollars. I'm like, look, I'm not coming out of fifteen hundred dollars six days into the year. It's just it's just not going to happen. Please give me my car back. There's just these scenarios that you can't plan for. And although that's an actually very painful story, I'm very grateful to be where I am now, where right. it was really a transfer of funds. It's it's a major inconvenience. I can't say minor, but it's an inconvenience now. This would have been a spiral back into debt just five years ago. That's what I was thinking. Five years ago, that, that would have been, don't get me wrong, it was hell, but it would have been total hell. Right. Yeah. It, it, like, I started, uh, we're probably talking about this on our show as well. I started hypotheticalizing with Rich. I'm like, this is a scenario where I don't know how it got my car back. Like if I didn't have three hundred dollars or you know friends or family to go to, and you you know you can kind of think about that now. And I, I like this is how people lose. You ever see those cars on the side of the road, and like there's just one flat tire and the orange stickers on the window, and you're like, where where are these people? <laughs> and like that was one of those scenarios. Like, hey, we just we got to leave the car behind, fellas. Like, what what are we gonna do here? We used to joke about that all the time, OG, about my car. And I don't know if you knew me then. But I drove a car that was so old that people jokingly said that I just had a screwdriver in the glove box and I was going to, when the, when the engine light finally came on and I pull over on the side of the road, I just take off the plate, scratch off the VIN number and, and walk away. <laughs> Start walking away. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and the other problem with that towing story, Marcus, is of course, is that it didn't stop at 300 bucks. You went and got it the next day. That meter's running for a lot of people. That's not a minor inconvenience. That's a catastrophe. You know, I was in college and I, I was late for a final exam. So I parked in a red zone because I had it would have been too far of a walk. Ah, what the hell? You know, I, you know, I'll take a twenty five dollar fine. I came out and my car was gone. God. Well, dummy me. I'm not thinking the car was towed because it was a red zone. I figured they just ripped me a ticket. I thought my car was stolen. So I went to the campus police station. I go, I want to report a stolen car. He goes, well, what's the car? And I told, you know, I gave the description of my car and he goes, oh, yeah, we just towed that, that, you know, that was parked in a red zone. I not only had to pay the fine for the red zone, I had to pay the towing fee and I had to pay storage for a day because I could, it was late at night, storage. so I couldn't go get it. And yeah, they, you have to pay for storage. And if you, let's say you're, you're, you know, two or three days, it just starts adding up. And then to add insult to injury, they damaged my muffler when they towed it. And they're not liable for any damage to your car when they tow it. Yeah. You, that I found out. I mean, that was an expensive lesson. Let me tell you. Wow. Number two on here. Why are you squandering what you have? And OG, as a financial planner, you see this all the time. I used to see this all the time. People that have like good cash flow and they go buy a boat on payments or they, they do this stuff with money where they're squandering their advantage and it just drives you crazy. Well, even with good cash flow, you know, it's frustrating talking with people say something like, well, you know, that interest rate's really low. It's at 0.9%. So, you know, why should I be in a hurry to pay it off? It's like, because it's $600 a month. <laughs> that $600 could be going somewhere else if just to yourself, just to your own bank account, let alone other places like an investment fund or something like that. And quite often, of course, it's not just a car payment. It's two car payments and a boat payment and two jet skis and the new cottage and as opposed to every single time, like Len said, when you get a pay raise, putting that away, instead it's like, well, how much more can I leverage this paycheck? You know, they're giving me an extra thousand dollars a month. 
some idiot at the bank will give me three thousand dollars a month of 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 payments on this, you know, uh, or three thousand dollars a month of loan on that payment or whatever. So it's really tempting, and and it's not just the big things either. It's it's a whole bunch of like little teeny tiny yeah. innocuous things that add up to be a whole bunch of money. Well, we see those subscriptions, right, Marcus? I mean, you, these subscriptions that you get, and hey, it's just give me another fifteen bucks. Another twenty bucks, and before you know it, you're using one of these services like Trim or whatever, and you look at your subscriptions you're like, I don't remember having half of those subscriptions. That's probably the case for some users. So what I do now is I track through Mint, and I say that because I was and Rich has heard this story eighteen times. He's going to hear eighteen times more till this battle is over. So an insurance company that I won't name raises my bill faithfully every six months, and it's by six dollars. And I think they've done an algorithm like. Seven dollars is where customers call in, and six dollars is where they let it go. <laughs> and they have made a, they've made a mortal enemy. Like I made a note, I like I I put on my phone, fight with insurance company this Saturday, and I called them up and I was like, what's going on with this six dollars? <laughs> like I let it go the first time, I might add. So it was like thirty six dollars. Like the second time they raised, I was like, nope, nope. And so I got four dollars back. Is how that story is. <laughs> and I I know they were sitting on their phone like. They can, they, I'm not rich, but they can see how much money I make. They have my profile. They're like, this guy is fighting us over $4. I'm probably the only customer that called in, but I just feel like sometimes these are billion dollar entities. Like you gotta, it's gotta be on principle sometimes. I'm like, no, you are questioning my character. I got a personal finance show. I'm not going to let it go. I can't wait to update the people. Cause I told them about this in 2018. I'm like, I'm making a note cause I'm busy through the rest of the year, but I'm a fight for this $6. It and sounds so, like, like cable companies yeah. do that and all sorts of other things too. Yeah. Just little yeah. bits. Yep. Yeah, um, my, there's a phone company who I'm after. Next. This all totals of twelve dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> but I just feel like sometimes I'm like, you're worth a billion dollars. It's my twelve dollars. I like that twelve dollars is like almost you know, well, almost an hour of my time, whatever the case may be. I want it back. Like you haven't earned it like I have. Marcus, so I, Marcus has this angry old guy down the way. OG oh, that I talk about Cinemark, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Like he's got that. Yeah. What I don't said. go into the don't go into Cinemark movies with Joe. <laughs> <laughs> the next on my list it is oh, it's so bad. Uh, number three here, I thought was pretty woo woo at first. I thought this was some new age crap. But the more I think about it, the more this gets back to you know Vicky Robin. And before you spend money, decide what's important to you, which is who are you really, right? I mean, Len, it's funny. I'm going to start with you yeah. because you're Mister <laughs> Practical Guy. But really, you start off with your values. And what this really says is start off with your values before you spend money. And does this really serve you or is it just you're just blowing cash? <laughs> well, if you know, if, if, if you're the type that likes to spend cash, I guess that's really you. So. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's like I don't I question everything. To me, everything is a want, you know, warm air in my house in winter is a want, not a not a need, you know, so <laughs> I kind of go overboard in that. but. You know, I do like the fact that they do ask you to go back and at least think about some of these things you want to buy. Maybe wait a day before you you see something you want to buy it on impulse. Maybe take a step back, go home, and then if you still want it the next day, then go back and get it. But that's me. I like this idea number four here. Oh, gee, are you clinging to things that no longer serve you? You know, the nation's being swept away by this Marie Kondo series and tidying up. But there's really something OG to this. Like, why are we hanging on to a bunch of crap in our life that doesn't serve us? Does it spark joy? Does it spark joy? <laughs> well, I'm not entirely sure how getting rid of old stuff puts money in your pocket other than selling it, I suppose. But I think in general, when it comes to being a little bit more thoughtful around with your surroundings, that'll domino into your decision making. Len was talking about waiting a day on making a decision about something. There's a really big purchase that I want to make and I'm totally envious of other people who've had it. In fact, it'd be super useful for my business, but it's a lot of money. And every time, every day for the last week and a half, I've gone into my purchase app on my phone where the thing is in my you know, shopping cart. And then I just look at it and then I say, okay, well, maybe tomorrow. And part of that is because I have a, that tool already. It's just not the latest and greatest tool. Yeah, but they're talking about this clutter around your house and how, and I get that that doesn't put money in your pocket right now, but the piece says, and I totally agree with this, like when I get a bunch of clutter or I go into somebody's house, it's really cluttered, I get exhausted. 
And you see, like I've been watching this Marie Kondo series, you see the before for these people. They can't even work in their kitchen. They don't want to eat at home because their kitchen's a disaster. So they go out to eat every night. There's there's money. You don't want to sit in your living room because there's stacks of crap all over it. So you end up hanging out at Starbucks or or someplace else. You just Cinemark. Or cinema, right? I'm not doing that anymore. But clutter, clutter is, uh, what does it say here? Clutter acts like stagnant energy lodged in our system. It's this frustration that when yep. you when you work in a clean space, it makes it so much easier to just get things done. Okay. I'll have to take your word for that. So you need a financial enema is what, what you're saying. That's, <laughs> that's how you... Delightful. <laughs> just... <laughs> The master, Better. the master of, uh, yeah. of thanks for that metaphor imagery, right? Appreciate it. Yep. N- number five, Len already talked about this. Can it wait? Number six is, do you have a budget or are you just winging it? We, I think we can let that talk for itself. And then yep. number seven, we talked about, are you investing in your future? And we'll link to this on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. But the biggest, I guess, biggest takeaway from this and people just being broken, living paycheck to paycheck, OG, people not having enough money. Biggest takeaway. <laughs> Well, for me, it's just about being intentional about decision making, whether it's something as simple as making sure that your next pay raise automatically goes into savings or you're smart about the things that are around you. I think if you're being smart about your day to day decision making, just not letting it happen to you, you're going to be better off. Len? Yeah, I'm with OG. It's all about decisions. And, you know, you've got to look at yourself and the decisions you made. And I think if you look inward, you will find how to come up with more money. That's very Zen for the most non-Zen guy I know. That is awesome. <laughs> Marcus, you're a guest. You get the last word, man. I actually like number five the most. Uh, can it wait? And I say that because in this particular generation, everything's such instant gratification with the Instagram culture and the social media and every you know, stunt on the gram. And uh, well, the fire festival is like the most recent flare up, although there'll be some other fraudulent festival or fraudulent thing that will come up. But it's always trying to impress these other people. And for what reason? So I think if you can slow down, take your foot off the gas, I automate everything. So I'm actually the exact reverse opposite of what OG just said there. Even, you know, going on now 40, I still haven't learned responsibility and accountability. So I get all the money, all the responsible things are funded by like the first week of the month. That's why the seventh wasn't particularly painful. It was just extremely annoying. It was just like, well, at least everything's paid for. No one's going to come for the car. Uh, I might be racing in some cases cases and scenarios, people would have been racing the loan officer to get the car from the tow truck company before I did. And it was just like, this really sucks. But I know the car is paid for, the rent is covered, the 401k is funded. Um, I didn't have a choice. That's another thing is my first job out of school, I made 20000 And I tell that story all the time because I had a business degree. I thought I was going to come out here balling, put the industry on its ear, six figures, bloop, 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 five years later, seven figures. It didn't quite work out like that. So I, I want people to know that and really just to know thyself. So that's where I really like the can it wait thing. I, I've, I've been going to the folded hot dog style now just to be offensive to younger millennials because I don't think they know what that means. But I folded a piece of paper hot dog style. I put needs in the left column and I put wants in the right column. And I kind of award myself with the wants when that extra money, it rarely comes, but when it does, is available. Well, before we fly into our Friday FinTech segment, let's talk about flying in general, because I got to tell you, something has made travel a lot more fun for me than it used to be, and that is Away Travel. Thanks to Away for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Away makes affordable, high-quality suitcases that charge your phone by cutting out the middleman. Away is able to offer the perfect luggage made with high quality materials at a much lower price. Comes in a variety of colors and four sizes. The carry on, I have one of those. The bigger carry on, I have one of those. The medium or the large, I don't have those. Away is designed the perfect suitcase to make your travel experience stress free. Here, here is what I like it features two USB ports and a high capacity battery that lets me charge my devices on the go. I always travel with an iPad that has some games on it or some reading on it, stuff to take on the plane. And I have my phone, which is a Model 6, which means the battery is old and this baby dies quickly. So instead of fighting for an airport outlet, I just use these two USB ports with my luggage. And it's funny, the looks that you get from other people. Frankly, I don't really care about the looks, but you can tell there's a bunch of people going, what what is that? 
It's made with premium impact resistant German polycarbonate. I have no idea what German polycarbonate is, but I do know it's impact resistant. This stuff has taken a beating and uh, has held up nicely. Four 360 degree spinner wheels that won't get stuck or break. It is a TSA approved combination lock built in to keep your belongings safe. And even overpackers can fit everything they need because they have this patent pending interior compression system that tightly buckles in bulky items. Comes with a lifetime warranty. If anything breaks away, we'll fix it or replace it for life. Carry on sizes are compliant with all major U.S. airlines. So it maximizes the amount you can pack and you have a hundred day risk free trial period if at any point you decide it's not for you return it for a full refund no questions asked and of course because you listen to stacky benjamins there's a special offer if you want twenty dollars off your next away travel suitcase head to awaytravel.com slash sb use promo code sb at checkout plus you get free shipping anywhere in the lower 48 states that's awaytravel.com slash sb promo code sb Oh, gee, you know how hard it is for people out there to pick a 529 plan for their kids or even to know what the heck 529 means. Uh, 529, it's the number right after 528. It is. And the number just before? 530. It's so amazing. Well, somebody who saw that frustration with her clients and also with her three kids is our next guest, Senia Udina. She created a new company. We're going to hear all about it right now on our Friday FinTech segment. And coming down the stairs to the basement, the creator of UNEST, Senio Udina. Did I get that right? You got it right. Thank you, Joe. How about that? <laughs> a lot of people have trouble with my name, so you're not the first one. Well, with a name like Saul Sihai, I totally get that. <laughs> Let, but, let's talk about UNEST because obviously we wanted to have you down here to the basement to talk about what you've created. Was it a frustration you had around kids and money yourself or was it an opportunity in the marketplace? Tell me about the genesis of UNEST. It was both, you know, like it was a combination of my personal experience and my professional experience that led me to creation of this company. You know, by virtual background, I'm a financial advisor. I spent over 10 years in the industry and I realized that currently only with the wealthy people have access to the college savings plans, right? This is crazy and <laughs> mind blowing to me. But, you know, all of my clients, you know, at one of the largest investment management firms in the United States, where I previously worked, they took advantage of 529 plans, college savings plans, due to the great investment return, due to the great tax benefits. However, most of the people in the United States are still not aware of 529 plans, right? So it's mind blowing, but 70%, 70% of people in the United States don't even know about 529 plans. A lot of people are still having trouble navigating through all available options and complexities associated with creating the account. Do you think that's partly because of the name? I mean, we couldn't have picked a crappier <laughs> 529 plan. You know, it just says nothing. It's so confusing. Yeah. And I talk to people about that and they're like, is it 509 right. or 528? I'm like, exactly. Let's start with the name. Let's fix the name first. <laughs> but I think that's part of the problem. And the whole industry is just like very complex and confusing and fragmented. And a lot of people like, because the plans are sponsored by the states, they have a lot of confusions, you know, like, do I need to be a resident of, of my own state to create the plan? Like so many confusions that go into that. But I just wanted to mention that, you know, speaking of my personal background, I graduated from the school with over 150,000 in student loans, right? Wow. It's, it's, it's insane, you know, like, and we all talk about this problem for our generation that student debt in the United States has reached this like unprecedented level of $1.5 trillion, right? It's a national problem. Yeah. Yet we're doing little to help solve it, right? So I, as a parent, I have three kids myself. I definitely want a better future for my kids. I want them to be prepared for this, you know, education to go into college. And all of my friends have similar concern. And not that many people in the United States realize that the college tuition inflation is rising at 6% per year, right? right? And it's expected 
to double in 10 years. So my 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 kids, right? Like when they graduate, they likely to graduate with over 300,000 in student debt, right? Like it's it's insane. How can we help to solve this problem for the future generation? So I would say that UNEST was born out of this desire to create solution for the middle class Americans, you know, like myself, like my friends, those people who do not have currently access to the wealth managers or financial advisors. When you were a financial advisor, I bet you saw this all the time. People saving into a savings account, earning nothing. And with inflation at 6%, like you just said, they're yeah. losing money with money sitting in a savings account. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I've seen this problem all the time. Generally, people, even the educated people, the doctors, lawyers, nurses, they know so little about finance. They know so little about investment. I think this is generally a problem. So we're trying to serve this role as a digital financial advisor, trying to educate the people, trying to explain the benefits of not only investing, but also taking advantage of these tax benefits that can accelerate the growth of the money over the years. 529 plans, that's a great, great vehicle sure. to save for education, right? Not only your money grow on average based on historical return by 6 or 7% per year and outpace the growth of the inflation, but they also grow tax-free, which is an amazing benefit. Yeah. Let's talk about how UNEST works then. Is it an app that I'm going to download, Xenia, or is it web-based? Tell me how I plug in initially. It's basically an app. Uh, right now, we are available on iOS. So if you have an iPhone, you can definitely download it and start using it. The beauty of it is that what used to be an incredibly confusing, you know, time-consuming process that would require hours of research and, you know, these meetings with expensive financial advisors, now is simplified into like five minutes. So it only takes five minutes for you to create an account. You can establish a monthly plan for each child, like individualized monthly plan uh, using our simple to use college calculator. And then you can keep track of all your savings on the go. So basically you can check the account balance, change contribution plan, make additional deposits, manage transactions, all from your mobile phone. Got it. Is, let's say that I'm using Google, I'm using Android. Is there any plans of it coming to those platforms? Yes, definitely. This is the next step in our big vision. Android version is coming up soon. So we're planning to release it in the next three months. And another great feature that all of our existing customers and prospective customers are so excited about is the gifting feature. So basically, if you have a kid, you know, around birthdays, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, like any holiday, your friends and family will be also able to contribute into the child's account directly instead of buying, you know, expensive toys oh, or cool. just bringing cash. We have so many exciting options, you know, like that we going to roll out like in the next few months. So if I'm an aunt or an uncle or just an interested friend in some kid's future, instead of buying yeah. them a toy, I just go to UNEST, I download the app, and then I start working through that and I can designate a beneficiary. So the way it's going to work, parents will need to create the account okay. for the kid and then just send the link to an aunt gotcha. or, you know, like... Yeah. And with that simple link, you know, anyone can, will be able to contribute. Just like choose the amount, choose the frequency... Little sweet note, go. Got you. And then 529 plans that you're using inside of it. Is it a wide range of plans? Is it just a few plans? How did you choose the investment vehicles on the inside? Right. So basically, as a financial advisors, we took an obligation to go through this rigorous analysis and pick the best plan for our families to offer on our platform. Because we believe that we don't have to offer all 50 or all 100 plans that are available to the families right now. Sure. We need to pick one that would serve them best. And we looked at a variety of criteria. We looked at the historical returns. We looked at the fees. So we make, made sure that the fees are low. We looked at availability of age-based options. We want to make sure that the minimum initial investment is only $25 you know, to start, which is like very accessible to everyone and that we partner with the very reputable investment management firms. So minimum then is $25, very, very low minimum to get in. Yeah. Okay. Next question then, how do you guys make money? Because I know how 529 plans, I mean, make money, but if I'm going through UNEST, how do you end up making money? Right. So I would, first of all, compare us to traditional financial advisor, right? Because for the most part, people don't understand much about investments. They don't understand much about finance and they need that help of the investment professional. 
traditional financial advisors, they typically cost 200 to $300 per hour for the meeting. On top of that, the advisor sold 529 plans. They have an underlying broker dealer commission, which is kind of a hidden fee, right? right? Which a lot of families are not even aware about. So with the help of this technology, you know, like, and because we were able to streamline all processes, we were able to waive most of those fees. And, you know, like we're not charging any, like anything to meet with us. So our fee is very simple, flat and transparent, $3 per month. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that makes it very easy. I like how transparent that is. $3, boom, done. Boom, done. Exactly. <laughs> Good. All right. So, and it's and it's unest.com. If people go to you, it's you dash dot nest. And we want to make sure people know that if you if you don't have the dash in there, you're ending up at a totally different site. That's exactly it. You dash nest.com. And the name of the company, like, you know, like it comes with the idea that we're trying to help parents create that nest for the future of their kids. But yes, it's you dash nest.com. I, I love that. Build the nest early too. Uh, and if you're uh, driving down the road or you are walking the dog, whatever it might be, we'll have all of Xenia's links and uh, the UNEST link on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes and explaining UNEST to us. No, thank you so much. It was lovely here at your basement. <laughs> thank you. Hey there, you trivia lovebirds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor and most eligible bachelor, Doug. Welcome to My Trivia. Today, let's celebrate one of the most important holidays of the year. Yes, more important than tax day and almost equal in standing to Halloween. I'm talking about no other day than February 15th. Wait, the 15th isn't on your holiday calendar, you say? It's only the National Day of Cheap Candy, people. True love is one thing, but have you seen the markdowns on those bags and bags of candy when the 15th rolls around? Talk about a steal. And if you manage to keep a few dozen bags around until next year's Valentine, can you say profit? I mean, that's pretty much what the holiday's all about, right? But this year, the shelves of your favorite supermarket will feel emptier than in past years. You know the little candy sweethearts you give to your crush? The ones that say, be mine, or true love, or I need a little snuggy snuggy? The sweetheart parent company, Neko, went bankrupt this past year and won't be producing any of those little gems. While that's bad news, there will be some good news coming out of old Doug's trivia. How many pounds of sweethearts did the Neko candy company typically sell in a year? I'll be back with your answer and the good news right after this. We explain this complicated game to Mr. Garrett backstage. Very complicated, Marcus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, it, it's actually very complex. <laughs> very complex. We play this <laughs> Price is Right style. For those of you new to this game, it's the closest without going over. And I believe the score is uh, OG has two. And uh, our guest... Through no fault of my own. I was going to say, our guest last week carried it home for you. And Paula has two, and Marcus is playing for Paula Pant from Afford Anything this week. And uh, Len is behind. Len, you won the first one of the year, I think. Yeah, but see, the problem is I you haven't had any guests. I've had to work on my own every single time. You need a guest to work for me. <laughs> That's right. <exactly. laughs> Len's like, why am I carrying my own weight here? If, if the magic here is having a guest... <laughs> Len's like, this game is rigged. I got to show up and I lose the trivia. Well, you have all these Mensa people come on and fill in and they get the right answer. I mean, I can't compete. Well, the good news is you get to decide first if you're going first in the middle or last. So, Len, which one are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go last. As if you played this game before. Marcus, are you going to go first or in the middle? I'm going middle. Yeah. Wow. As if he knows what he's doing, too. That means, OG, you're first. How many pounds of sweethearts did the Neko candy company typically sell in a year? So 310 million Americans, let's say 5% of them actually give a crap about Valentine's day. So that's 15 million people. And each person gets eight ounces, 15 million times eight, uh, is a lot like 60, So 90 million ounces. Uh, So why didn't you convert that? Why didn't you convert the eight ounces to pounds 
before you did your multiplication. <laughs> because I want to divide 90 million ounces <laughs> by 16, obviously. Oh. <laughs> Duh. Well, why am I, I like, helping you anyway? I know, that's what I'm thinking. Very much. <laughs> So, uh, so back to, to, to 15. So I'm going to say, uh, 15 million pounds, 15 million pounds, Marcus. Well, I guess we got to show our math here and I'm going to add a zero, but I originally worked through 50 States. Like OG said, a couple of those are flyover States. So they probably don't care about Valentine's whoa, day, whoa. but then I thought that was a trick question. So I put whoa. those back in ah, I there's you know, 2000 pounds, which I'm not sure. and didn't have a chance to Google in a ton. And then I was just going to multiply that times 50, but then you said million. So I'm going to go with, what was your answer? 15 million. He said, I'm at 15 all right, all right. million. I'm, I'm going to go with 10 million then 10 million. Final answer. 10 million for Marcus. This is pounds, right? Yes. Pounds of pounds Pound sterling. Of... Pound sterling. <laughs> <laughs> you can go with grams. I tried to convert that too. <laughs> it's it's in pounds sterling. Pounds sterling, which is equal to what? Five bucks. <laughs> that that actually break your teeth if you tried to bite into those, wouldn't? <laughs> no, um, just the one with the queens on them. You're right. <laughs> let's see. So pounds. How many pounds were sold? Gosh, you know, those little boxes, those little boxes of sweethearts, those can't be. Were you guessing a half a pound of a box? Because those little boxes are like one, you know, there's only like 20 sweethearts in those things. I, I think thinking, they're only like, I, I think I, it's I like th one sixteenth of a, they're like one or two ounces. Okay. I was thinking more of like in second grade, the industrial size bag that everybody brings. <sighs> Because we're only talking about the people who actually give a crap about sweethearts. Let's say, okay, so let's just do it this way. Don't. Let, let's just, you know, I, I, I can just say 15 million and one, but I ain't going to do that. So, yeah, 300 million people, let's say 10% uh, buy sweethearts. That's 3 million. That's 30 million people and a tenth of an ounce. Uh, so, which is basically a tenth of a pound, a little, little more, but just to make it easy. So, that's 3 million pounds. Uh, I'm going to say three million pounds. Three million pounds. I like that math, too. I'm so excited that we get to collaborate with best-selling author Michael Connolly by telling you about Murder Book. It's the new true crime podcast hosted by Michael Connolly, of course, best-selling author. And thanks to Michael Connolly and Murder Book for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Murder Book podcast works with the very same detectives who inform his novels and his hit TV show, Bosch. The podcast explores real homicide cases not covered by mainstream media. Season one is the telltale bullet dives into a 30 year old Hollywood carjacking gone wrong. that tests the limits of the American criminal justice system. So Michael Connelly returning to his roots, which is pretty cool. And by the way, if you're a reader Dark Sacred Night is out, also from Michael Connolly. It's his latest number one bestseller featuring detectives Harry Bosch and Renee Ballard. Nothing I like better than a new Michael Connolly book. And I don't only have a book, I have a podcast, I've watched Bosch. I feel like I got Michael Connolly all over, which is not a bad thing. There's a reason that guy is so successful, and it's because of the fact that his podcast and his books are always a delight. Cheryl couldn't put down Dark Sacred Night. I finally got to start it. Thank goodness. Uh, I am a slow reader and I'm already 85 pages in within two days. It's, it's, it's been quite a ride. So be sure to check out Michael Connolly's new murder book podcast on Apple podcast or wherever you get your podcast, or just go to murderbookpodcast.com. That's murderbookpodcast.com. All right. OG, you got 15 million. You're the top guy. You're the top dog. A lot of people eating I'm lots of sugar. You, you are. A will, will you be mine? <laughs> The, uh, uh, maybe, uh, and then Marcus, 10 million pounds mm -hmm. feeling good. I am. I am. You got a $5 million runway and Len, you, you yeah. locked in at 3 million. I'm wondering why you didn't just lock in at one, $1. Yeah. Then you would have gotten all that between $1 and 10 million. It's like, you've never played this damn game before. Uh, you know what? Dang it. I was just, yeah, you're right. I should have. That was stupid. <laughs> If you're gonna oh go low, my God, go that low, was baby. Stupid. See, this is why you need the this is why you need a guest to play for me because a guest wouldn't have made that stupid mistake. You're right. I should have. Boy, that was dumb. I will. Okay. I will. I will love this if Doug says 
it's 2.9 million pounds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that will be awesome. All right, Doug, what's our answer? Welcome back, confectionery connoisseurs. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I just found an old bag of these Neko sweethearts that I can share with the guys. Let's tear this bad boy open and see what we get. Be mine. Not sure which of the guys that's going to, so let's, uh, let's see. check out number two here. Sweet pea. Okay. Yeah, surely number three is going to do it for me. Wink, wink. All righty. How's a guy supposed to decide who gets which sweetheart between Joe and OG and Len? I'm just going to... I'll just leave these sweethearts laying around and they can decide who gets which one, but I kind of hope Len gets wink, wink. Anyway, before the break, I asked you this trivia. How many millions of pounds of sweethearts did the Neko Candy Company typically produce in a year before declaring bankruptcy, of course? The answer? The candy giant was selling 19 million pounds of sweethearts each year that you, your teeth, and your dentist are going to be missing this Valentine's Day. But the really good news? Spangler Candy Company has acquired Neko and will be resuming production for Valentine's Day 2020. Until then, any sweethearts you find were produced prior to July 2018. So remember that if someone gives you a little treat this year, it's a little old. See ya! Good job, OG. That was excellent. Yes, sir. Boo, Everybody actually, you're a, much, you're a much better sport. I was upset. I'm upset. <laughs> I'm actually still upset. Marcus is uh, going to flip the table. I'm taking this game to heart. <laughs> right. Like, a, like one of those bad time games time of uh, Monopoly gone wrong. <laughs> it's, the, it's the $6 all over again. Yeah, it is. Len's going to make Thank a big you. comeback, though, like the Magic 8-Ball does. How about that, Len? Do you, <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you have the 8-Ball sitting there? Yes, I do. Will Len Penzo make a big comeback this year when it comes to our trivia challenge? The outcome cannot be predicted. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like that. That is good for ratings. We're going to leave yeah. that. That is great for ratings. Who good knows? Oh, boy, guess what? Let's take out the magnifying glass, guys, and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to you courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you're going to find those financial products you use every day. They are nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of the products available online, those are all ranked at magnify money. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more, whether it's reducing the amount of interest you pay to the man or getting a higher rate on your savings account. Let's look up. Actually, it's a little bit before. So these rates have probably with in a rising interest rate environment climb. You know, I was looking at CDs the other day and the best I could find for my little amount was 2.75. But let's. Uh, if that's Robin Hood. You're going to have to scratch it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Interest rate right now. Uh, CIT Bank, uh, 2.45, Len. My Savings Direct, 2.4. CIBC, 2.39. 2.39. So if you've got 2.7, 2.75. Wow. That's what I found. That was last week. That is better than I've seen. And they compare a ton of places. So fantastic. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money or forward slash Len. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one of those we want to do. But today we're going to help Matthew magnify his money. Say hi, Matthew. Hey guys. Hope y'all having a good day. I had a question for Financial Independent as it pertains to real estate versus the stock market. As of right now, my fiance and I are 24. We make around 100000 a year and only live off around 30000 Obviously, we don't have kids and we don't have a mortgage or any loans, so we don't have much overhead. But we're going to try not to expand our lifestyles too much in the future. That being said, we're saving a lot of money and we're investing in the stock market via Roth IRAs, company 401ks along with just some mutual funds outside of retirement investments. We like the idea of rental real estate, but aren't huge on the whole debt idea. The question comes with, do we continue to just invest in the market for, say, the next 10 years, stockpile a lot of money, and are able to live off dividends? Or is it a better idea to go with some real estate, have the cash flow, and probably be able to stop our jobs even sooner if we wanted to? That being said, we don't hate our jobs. We're just looking for the freedom to do what we want to in the future. Thanks as always. I'm sure I won't listen to anything y'all say. <laughs> which is which may be a good idea. 
Thanks for the question, Matthew. Marcus, uh, any thoughts? What do you think? Real estate versus investing in the stock market? At first, I was nervous. There was a lot of pressure about getting this wrong. But then he said he's not going to listen to anything I say. So he freed me <laughs> up to get my real response. So I, I didn't mention whether he was going to fund uh, the 401k to max if there's any profit match that they have with the company. So I would say always do that because that's free money that's left on the table. And that could also increase your uh, returns if there is some money available that you otherwise wouldn't get in the market. If someone's charging me, they also not only have to charge me and make more than the market, they have to beat the market more than they're charging me. So there's two layers in which they have to beat. So I don't have any real estate myself, but that's kind of my personal choice. My concern there is that I think people talk about the downturn in the stock market because it's really visible. But when the real estate market downturns as well, you're chasing after those people for rent and money as well. And that's just not a particular situation I want to put myself in as a landlord. And then I guess my third and final piece of advice, would one thing I would be and I did for myself, I use investor.gov. It's a federal website that nobody talks about because the federal government is really horrible at advertising anything, but it actually has a lot of great information. And they have a compound interest calculator and a savings goal calculator, and it can map it out for the next 40, 50, 60 years or whatever you may be interested in. So that's how I came up with my savings goal of 100,000. There are several different reasons behind that if we want to go into that. But you can tailor it to your lifestyle. You can also calculate variance. It'll go 3% above your estimate or 3% below. That's usually the rate I use, but I'm sure you could put it in whatever metrics you want. So again, investor.gov. So I would say have a funding goal. Like what are you trying to reach, whether that's over 10 years or period? That's a great resource. I love that. Uh, Len, I like what Marcus said about about real estate. We don't hear about downturns in real estate, but when we do, it tends to flush everybody out. And I think it's because I heard recently somebody say that in real estate, because you use leverage, it magnifies the number of winners during up years, but it also magnifies the number of losers in down years because you're you're leveraged in this position. So, you know, 2007, 2008 hits, the system gets really cleaned out. But real estate versus the stock market, what do you think? Gosh, you know, it's it, this, is one of those, this is totally personal, Joe. It's what you want. I mean, there's no risk here. So, you know me, Mr. Hate Risk. So, we know somebody who... Back in the heyday of 2007, 2006, 2007, they had bought a lot of real estate and a lot of homes. And then the market turned and all they were raking in the dough. They were raking in the dough on rents and stuff. And the market turned and they were leveraged and they had to get rid of all those homes yeah. and they ended up selling at a loss. They got it hurt. So, you know, it's just how much risk you want to, you know, you want to take on really. But long term, OG, I mean, you know, real estate versus the stock market. What do you think? Well, this kind of comes down to a little bit of begin with the end of mind here. Financial independence, of course, is unique to everybody and it's different based on, you know, your time frames and things like that. I would suggest that while you're 24, your idea of financial independence will be different than when you're 34. And what that means might be a little bit different. By all means, that doesn't mean you shouldn't save right now. In fact, by my math, you're probably saving $40,000 a year, which if you did that for the next decade, you probably end up with between six and $700,000 by the time you're in your mid thirties. So that's a pretty gosh darn good start. But I think when it comes to the real estate component of it, just like you said, Joe, in terms of the magnifying the upside and the downside, I think the other thing that happens a little bit more is people talk more about esoteric type things and not necessarily that real estate's so unique, but it just sounds really cool, right? Like I've got somebody else paying my mortgage. I'm making this extra cash flow. But if all of that doesn't happen continuously, that cash flow or that profit for the year or those two years worth of or five years worth of debt pay down by somebody else can all vanish in an instant. I just read an article about somebody who spent six weeks trying to find their next tenant you know, just kind of a normal turnover situation. And that effectively wiped out the entire year's worth of profit because after accounting for all the expenses, the upkeep and the deferred maintenance that happens when you have a turnover in a tenant, that's when you fix all the stuff that you've been meaning to fix. It took all the profit for the year out. So it doesn't necessarily make it a good thing or bad thing. What it sounds like is if you don't like debt and you don't like the idea of leverage, then I would stay the heck away from it. You know, it's uniquely personal financial planning. And if you prefer not to have it, then I wouldn't do it. Or if you did, maybe the right thing is to pay cash for a property in an area that you can afford just to pay cash for it. And then you don't have to worry about the cash flow to maintain the debt. 
you're just holding, you know, you're exchanging a bucket of cash for a property or something like that. I still don't think that's a great idea until that only represents, you know, five or 10% of your net worth. It's not like you're going to take all $700,000 that you've saved in 10 years from now and go dump it all on a real estate building. Yeah. On a single building. Yeah. On one building. That's like the same thing of putting all your money in one stock. Yeah. You might take 60,000 of it and go buy a duplex for cash. That, That might be a good idea, but that's 10 years down the line. So uh, we've talked about this before. Everybody likes steps 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 in the process because those are like the fun ones. But what you're doing right now are steps 1, 2, and 3, which is control your cash flow like we talked about earlier today. Get in a good habit of savings. Start funding your Roth accounts. Start funding your retirement accounts through work. And reaching financial independence necessarily isn't always about hedge funds and you know 20-door apartment buildings. You know It can be just boring Roth IRAs and 401ks for the next 15 years too. Marcus, do you see yourself ever owning real estate? I do. Uh, that was really great advice. And I think that's the point. I, my goal right now is 100000 uh, because of what I can see that returning in the stock market. And uh, in this case, it would be an index fund that I'm investing in. And also another thing is the two, well, one of the funds that you mentioned, the 401k, it's inherently for retirement. So that's why I'm less risk averse there. Like it's supposed to help me when I'm in my 60s and 70s. And yeah. so I'm I'm purposely risk avoiding there. And another thing, um, exactly when uh, OG was doing the math there that it, it didn't even occur to me when I was answering the question, I, I think a lot of people do this, sounds like Matthew's doing as well, is it's what's this other one revenue stream I can do to replace my job or passive income? The scenario I used recently, like Bezos isn't going like, you know what, I got too many revenue streams. And so with the funds that it sounds like he's coming in, it sounds like this is something he can try out, especially if there's a cash property or a low risk property he could try. And if it doesn't work out, you're not too vested in it. You can get out. He's 24. He's got plenty of opportunities. He's literally got age on his side to kind of, I wouldn't say risk. That's probably not the appropriate word here, but I feel like a lot of people are like, I can only do one or the other. And he quite literally sounds like he has the means to do both in this scenario. Yeah. Dip your toe in the water a little bit. Right. Yeah. But you know, my thought is, and I love what Len said about it being completely personal. When you look at long-term returns, by the way, the North American real estate index, uh, REIT index, uh, real estate investment trust index, and the S&P 500 over long periods of time have done pretty close to exactly the same thing. So when it comes to intensely personal, it really is that. And realize that both of these asset classes have downsides downside of a stock is trying to pick the right price of what a stock's worth on any given day is difficult because it fluctuates a bunch. Real estate doesn't fluctuate as quickly. So I see people say, you know, I'll take real estate because I don't like that fluctuation. Well, here's what you got instead. You can't rip off your bathroom to go buy some groceries. You know, I mean, you got a bunch of money locked up, so it's difficult to be liquid in real estate. So it's incredibly personal. And I, too, like the idea of, that Marcus brought there of, of doing both. And what OG and Marcus said about keeping the end in mind, you know, start with a goal, work backwards. I think that's great. Thanks for the question. And by the way, if you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And guess what? He's taking home the greatest money show on earth circus T-shirt that represents what a circus this podcast is. So let's talk about, to finish this thing off, what's going on where you guys live. Len, what's happening at the aptly titled LenPenzo.com? I've got an article on how to fix your finances without money, without money. So how to get yourself all back in shape without any money at all. It's just... So come on by and check it out. I I don't want to spoil Len's piece, but it's just magic and unicorns. (laughs) Happen in the, in well, the, it's too late. You just spoiled it. Forget it. Nobody come over and it does. I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have given it. I'm so sorry. No, I'm sure it's a lot better than Benji. No, there's there's at least, there's like 13 recommendations there. I think uh, that is awesome. No, there's not a unicorn is not in there. That'll help people a ton, Len, that were attracted by our title today of, you know, reasons why you're broke. I mean, fix it without yes. cash. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, gee, what are you doing here this next week besides recording more with me? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, February for us is the calm before the storm. You know, late this month, we're going to do a little bit of a podcast tour. You and me going to hit the road a little bit. We're going to go to uh, California and Seattle. Um, San Francisco, watch out. We're on our way. 
San Francisco area. Yes. I think we're still dueling it out over <laughs> exactly, where in San Francisco. Exactly where. I had I had a place all picked out and then you went, well, I want to stay go to this place. So, oh, well, anyways, so we'll have that out shortly. I Probably like, by the time this is. Uh, I like recorded. how I talk in OG's stories. Oh, yeah. in, in my mind, you, you're like, nee, nee. <laughs> that's it's like the Charlie Brown voice. But then once that hits, all bets are off. For me, the rest of the spring is busy, full of travel and that sort of stuff. So this is me just working on projects for clients here, but also kind of some strategic time because that kind of evaporates starting next month. Awesome. Marcus, thanks a ton for hanging out with us tonight. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Well, anytime. It was, I was so excited that you could be on the show. What's happening to Paychecks and Balances? Um, we'll be putting out our first course. So you alluded to, actually, when I came on the show, I think, actually, I think it's been years now. I had just written the book, Isn't so the book crazy? is dead for you. Yeah, that is yeah, so exactly. crazy. So the book is uh, Debt Free or Die Trying, and I'm converting that into a four-week course just to get people started on the right foot because I feel like a lot of the mistakes that people make is either they never get started. We still have, you know, shout out to the listeners and the fans that have come over, but they've been talking about getting the journey started all three years that we've been around. And every new year, they got that debt-free resolution. And so I'm going to give them a little four-week course to put together. The blog is back. And if you go over to paychecksbalances.com, like our top post of 2018 was, has the financial independence retire early? movement burned out has oh, fire burned out stirring so, the pot you know you know it's uh it's not just clickbait there's more behind the title so yeah go ahead and check it out that is awesome and we'll link to the podcast which by the way you can get anywhere right marcus Yes, we are on everything except, I believe, SoundCloud. So we have our mixtape yeah. everywhere but SoundCloud, the yeah. official mixtape platform. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we are not on SoundCloud either. That's a one. So if you're listening to this, you're not listening on SoundCloud. So there you yes. go. All right. That's going to do it for today, guys. Oh, by the way, I'll have all those links to not only Marcus's course, but the Paychecks and Balances site, and uh, how to listen to the show on our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. All right. Take it from here, Doug. What should we have learned today? Hey there, Joe. Sure, yeah, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned. First, take some advice from our roundtable gang. Feeling like you don't have enough cash? Maybe it's your priorities that aren't in order. Ask yourself a few important questions and you may find yourself adding to your pile of Benjamins in no time. Second, how's your child's college fund looking? Maybe you should check out some 529 plans to get the ball rolling in the right direction. But the big lesson? Don't accept the sweetheart candy from Joe's mom that says, Rub my swollen feet. Nope. I'm not doing it, lady. I am not touching those paws. Special thanks to Ksenia Udina from UNEST for stopping by the basement. You can find her site at u-nest.com or in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks also to Marcus Garrett for joining us. You'll find his podcast, Paychecks and Balances, wherever you're listening to us right now. Len Penzo appears courtesy of LenPenzo.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm wondering if KY Jelly is actually made in Kentucky. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. It's called the medium sketch. The medium sketch? Yeah, it wasn't rare and it certainly wasn't well done. <laughs>
So my mom was in the hospital for a little while. Um, thankfully, okay, as okay as could be expected. She had real bad stomach issues and whatnot, and they tried to diagnose it. And, and kind of where they're at right now is celiacs and or Crohn's disease, mm. which is just, you know, yeah, a total nightmare if you're trying to, like, not plan your dinners. And so we're going through and talking about all the food she can't have. She can't have this. She can't have that. Can't eat this. Can't eat that. Have to have this made this way. Da, 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 da. And I flippantly say, well, don't forget, you have to find a new gas station because you can't be using ethanol in your Cadillac anymore. She goes, well, why not? I said, well, corn, you know, the way they process it, it can have tons of gluten in it. She's <laughs> just totally loses her mind <laughs> because it's just like the 40th thing on her list of stuff she can't do. And she's like, oh, great. Now I have to find a new gas station. Because they have to find ethanol free gas. <laughs> and so I could totally see my mom inquiring to the gas station attendant. Uh, I, I have a gluten intolerance. Uh, do you know if this gas is gluten free? Which is something I love your mom, but that's something that she would do. <laughs> she, well, that and or she'd get in a fight with her husband about how she can't ride in his truck because it's not gluten free gasoline or something. Just, <laughs> like it'd be this long drawn out two week battle. I'm like, I can't ride in your truck, damn it. I'm gluten intolerant. Growing up on the west side of Michigan, my parents had some friends that uh, they would, you know, go places with. And as they're driving down the road, they pass this field. It's on the side of a hill with these cows. And my dad said, I said, those hill cows are just amazing, aren't they? And their friend Mary is like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, for the notice how the cows look like they're standing straight up. The way they do that is when they're born, they're like genetically born with their right side legs are shorter than their left side legs so they can stand straight up on the side of a hill. Those are called hill cows. She's like, real, that's amazing. Then the next time they're driving, they're with some other couple. And my parents, my parents' buddy, the, the woman's husband was like, it was amazing. Mary going on and on explaining to these people how those were hill cows. And about how the <laughs> the right side legs are shorter, <laughs> just <laughs> completely Good bought free it. Gas. Good luck, mom. Love Mar you, Marcus. Your family's way too smart for any of that. I'm sure. I'm gonna go with yes because they listen to the show, <laughs> and I'm not sure if we're on a hot mic or not yet. So yes, they are, they are both geniuses, and I am lucky That's to be their good. offspring. <laughs> Len, what about your family? Uh, no, not geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, but you're not you're not putting any of that stuff by the honeybee. What do you mean putting that stuff by the honeybee? You know, like hill cows or or gasoline that's uh Oh, I won't get the results. Are you kidding? That won't get by her. No. Are you kidding? None of that shit. No. She gets that no. stuff by you. I'll bet. Yes, all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely, Joe. 